The international community is warning the situation in Burundi is deteriorating. Hundreds of people have been killed since the president ran for a controversial third term. So is Burundi on the brink of civil war, or can the violence be contained? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the programme. I'm Martine Dennis. On the brink of civil war, that's a warning about the situation in Burundi at the moment. The US Special Envoy for Africa's Great Lakes region says the country is at risk of descending into total chaos. Thomas Periello is calling for urgent regional mediation to establish some kind of peace process between the government and opposition groups to prevent further bloodshed. Well, the crisis began earlier this year when President Pierre Nkurunziza ran for a controversial third term in office, and he won. That led to months of protests and violence, including an attempted coup. The United Nations says at least 240 people have been killed since April. Hundreds of thousands of people have fled to neighbouring countries. And in the latest violence, gunmen wearing police uniforms fired on a car they believed was carrying a police commander in the capital Bujumbura. He wasn't injured, but the attackers were shot and killed. Well, the killings have led to the formation of vigilante groups. Armed men patrol the streets and have vowed to defend themselves against the security forces. Some of them have been speaking to Al Jazeera on the condition that we don't reveal their identities. Police have been coming to our neighborhood at daytime to arrest and kill us. But at night, we go to where they are and fight them. But the government has dismissed criticism on how it's dealt with the situation and blames the opposition for the violence. The plotters, uh, they failed to make their coup d'etat. But now they found another way. They try to negotiate with the government. But uh, this is not fair. You cannot negotiate with the government when you are committing um, homicides like this one. Well, some have said there's an ethnic dimension to the crisis in Burundi, so let's take a closer look at that. The country has two main ethnic groups, the Tutsis and the Hutus. Historically, the Tutsi have been a minority, but they've controlled the elite institutions, including the military. While the Hutu, accounting for around 85% of the population, generally held little power, leading to feelings of resentment. In 1993, long-standing ethnic divisions between the two groups resulted in civil war. Well, that conflict ended in 2005 after an estimated 300,000 people had been killed in the fighting. All right, let's bring in our guests now. Joining us from the Burundian capital, Bujumbura, we have Porik Makarakta. He's a photojournalist and filmmaker who's lived in Burundi for more than two years. In London, we have Jonathan Ofeansa, the founder and publisher of Africa Briefing magazine. And in Oxford, we have Patricia Daly, associate professor of human geography at Oxford University. She's also written a book on Burundi. Uh, welcome to you all. Porik, can I start with you as you're in at Bujumbura? What's the feeling on the streets? These ominous warnings are gathering pace, aren't they? suggesting that Burundi is on the brink of very serious deterioration in terms of intercommunal relations. I mean, absolutely. It's a very tense situation here in Burundi. Um, one of the remarkable things about this is that we feel perhaps that we've been at breaking point for, for many months now. And we've seen a certain level of violence prolonged much longer than a lot of people here expected. I think when we talk about a deterioration, certainly what's already happening is, is very severe. Hundreds have been killed, hundreds more have been arrested, arbitrarily and detained, uh, wounded. You know, there are thousands of people internally displaced and about a quarter of a million people have, have left the country as, as refugees. So I don't want to sort of downplay what's currently happening in talking about a deterioration, but certainly the potential for things to really go either way. I think there is still a window open, an opportunity to calm things down and to stabilize the situation, but equally possible given the conditions at the moment, we could see a continued 
any uh, security deterioration. But, but what's it like when you go out of the front door of your house? What's it like? Are, are people uh, walking freely on the streets or are people uh, uh, apprehensive and staying indoors? I think it's a little bit of both. Uh, it's something of a paradox. Life does go on as normal. I mean, it has to. And the people who either choose to stay here or have no option to leave have to go about their lives and their business. One of the most frequent problems that I do encounter is just people complaining about the economy, the lack of money being spent, the lack of money being around. And that's not necessarily directly related to the aid cuts that we've seen the government suffer. Um, but it's tense. People go home in the evening. It gets much quieter, much sooner, uh, with increasing number of attacks and raids on bars and restaurants. We're seeing people going out less. So certainly there's an atmosphere of fear, but at the same time, life also goes on as usual. And Jonathan of Ayansa in London, what we've got in uh, Bujumbura, in Burundi more generally, is a, a toxic mix, isn't it, of paramilitary forces, of vigilante groups, and of course security forces who are currently being accused of extrajudicial killings. Yes, I mean, the situation... Um it's deteriorating by the day, you know, from the, from the reports um, we are getting here, whereby I um, understand um, some paramilitary police, paramilitary para forces, you know, go from house to house at night, you know, killing the perceived opponents of um, in Kuruziza. This does not bode well. And there are also some indications that um, these killings could be, uh, are being done along ethnic lines. And it does not bode well for the future of the country, the security and the political future of the country. And um, the earlier, the earlier the international organizations like the UN, AU, and the economic, uh, sorry, East Africa uh, community step in, you know, the better it will be to uh, avert what um, happened in, uh, in neighboring Rwanda 21 years ago. Yes, indeed. Now, Patricia, how dangerous a moment is this, would you say, for uh, Burundi, given, as John has uh, alluded to, given that uh, fundamental fault line that still exists in, uh, in Burundi, and that, of course, of the ethnicity? I think it, is, it has been grave as, uh, for some time now. Um, I wouldn't want to put a lot of stress on the ethnic element because um, I'm not on the ground. Um, I, I, I do understand from some of the reports that some of the people being targeted um, on both sides are from different ethnic groups. Um, but that I cannot clarify. Uh, but there is also, there's always the danger that the situation could, could, can degenerate and the factoring um, along ethnic lines, which took place in the 1990s, um, you know, could develop. And that would be very serious. And uh, Parikh, tell us about these opposition forces. Uh, they are, uh, there's a variety of groups from what we understand with quite divergent views. Some of them want to see the back of Pierre and Kurunziza. Others want what? Well, I think that one of the problems the opposition has suffered, I mean, this even goes back to the 2010 elections when they boycotted almost all of the elections that took place, is the opposition has struggled really to unite uh, behind either a common leader or a really common set of policies. Uh, and that has continued to this day. There has now been an umbrella kind of opposition organization called Senared, um, which has been set up, but doesn't represent absolutely everyone. One of the key opponents of uh, President Kornziza is Agatan Rawasa, who has chosen actually um, to take up a seat in Parliament is not being part of this Senate. But we've also, what we've seen over these last few months especially, has been uh, what we might describe as an armed opposition. It's a bit unclear whether to call them uh, vigilantes, as Reuters did, or, or to call them terrorists, as the government is doing. But they've been uh, using weapons which are relatively freely available following the civil war and a lack of disarmament. And they've been uh, certainly targeting attacks. I would certainly lean on what Jonathan was saying about it being along ethnic lines. I think, as Patricia was saying, that ethnicity is a key factor in anything political that goes on in Burundi. But fundamentally, that is not the key uh, fault line of what we're seeing now. It is a largely political crisis that has the danger of, uh, of becoming more ethnic. Certainly, politicians are manipulating um, the ethnicity element on both sides. But I would say... An enormous amount of resistance um, towards that has been has been found within the population. Generally, people people are not really seeing on the ground that kind of ethnic hatred. And um, 
Uh, John, you referred to, of course, the Rwanda genocide uh, of just over uh, 20 years ago. Um, alarm bells are particularly uh, uh, poignant in this instance, aren't they? Because the international community either failed to see or refused to see the warning signs then that led to the uh, massacre of 800,000 people in Rwanda. So is the international community concentrating firmly enough on the situation in Burundi in order to prevent Burundi returning to this kind of ethnic strife that it's seen in its very recent past? Yes, I believe the international community, especially the, the UN, and when I say the UN, I mean the UN Security Council, you know, I have actually debated uh, this issue over the past uh, few weeks. And um, from what I believe, um, they are trying to uh, take measures, you know, to either to send some peace, peacekeeping forces into Burundi or, you know, send uh, some, uh, uh, begin some mediation efforts, you know, to, um, to forestall any possible repetition of what happened in um, Rwanda um, 21 years ago. So, um, and again, um, there are efforts by some regional leaders, you know, within the Great Lakes, East African Great Lakes region, and I believe the African Union too are also trying to take measures, you know, to contain the situation. And Patricia, a lot of uh, responsibility has fallen upon the regional mediating group, particularly the East African states, the leader of whom is uh, President Museveni of Uganda. Um, he intervened earlier on in the year. Clearly, he failed, doesn't seem to be terribly interested. He's perhaps more interested on his own uh, re-election, which is due at the early next year. Should the responsibility for mediating the situation in Burundi lie with the East African states, when clearly they've, they've not managed much so far? I think it's important that they play a role in this. Um, if we looked at the 2000 peace agreement, uh, peace negotiations that started in 1998 um, and led to the Arusha peace agreement, um, the foundation on which this current um, the government is based, um, you know, it was uh, instigated, uh, you know, at the initiative of regional um, uh, leaders. Um, then um, former President Julius Nyeri. Um, it was a, he was well respected, and he was able to um, claim considerable authority. And he, his role was then taken over by Nelson Mandela, uh, and therefore I think they were able to push for a peace agreement. In this context, the international, the East African community have to act. They cannot allow the situation to de degenerate so that there's a civil war or genocide within the um, territory. Uh, the economic, first of all, the human rights of the Burundian people needs to be uh, protected. The economic situation in uh, the East African community is dependent on peace, security and stability in the region if they want the economies to grow. So I think they have to act. And it might be that these... Uh, President Museveni has to be reinforced by other members of the African Union um, and by civil society organizations in order to push for um, you know, mediation for the, for the Burundians to come to some sort of dialogue. And uh, John, uh, the African Union uh, has emphasized, hasn't it, in, in recent years, as you well know, African solutions to African problems. But this sounds like something urgent needs to be done on Burundi. Is the African Union uh, fit and capable to respond in a short and effective manner, which is, of course, what is required right now for Burundi? Well, to put it candidly, I wouldn't say so. Because, look, um, let me go to um, West Africa. You know, earlier this year, uh, Kampari, the ex-president Kampari, attempted to um, amend the constitution and extend, you know, um, um, his rule. Okay. Now the people rose up against him and was ousted. Just last weekend, we've had, a, and um, the ECOWAS, you know, got up. Mahama and uh, Buhari and some others, they all got up and make sure that, you know, uh, Kampare will go, and they set a framework in place which was followed. And last week, happily, they had a peaceful and successful free and fair elections to elect a new so president. What, so what you're suggesting now, is this, we, uh, this we, is ECOWAS negotiated and it wasn't ECOWAS, the AU, yeah, yeah, is that what yeah, you're saying? Yeah. Now, the, the, uh, well, well, yeah, so the, uh, the AU as a body 
could take a cue from what's happened within the ECOWAS region. Now, um, to me, the ECOWAS, no, to me, sorry, the AU has, to me, has become a talk shop. They meet, they talk, you know, a lot of talk, a little action, okay? And we, and, and, uh, you, we mentioned the leaders within the region too. Please, some of these leaders themselves are trying to amend their constitutions. Either they have, or they are trying to amend their constitutions, right, to extend their stay in power. One has been in power for over 30 years, right, um, harassing and imprisoning, uh, imprisoning uh, the, uh, his opponents, okay? So what credibility do they have? All okay, right, to okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, Parik, so what are the issues then? Um, let's assume that uh, one body or other is going to get itself into gear and to start providing a mechanism by which the various parties in Burundi can talk. What are the issues that have to be contended with? Uh, the economy has got to be one because underlying all of this, of course, is a minus 7% growth rate. Uh, that's according to the IMF. Absolutely, and it's a, it's a huge problem that Burundi's been facing. And a lot of critics of, of the current president have said that while he has uh, brought some economic improvement in his 10 years in power, he seems now with this decision to go for this third term to have turned that around. Obviously, the government response is uh, that if it weren't for the insurgency, as they call it, of, of the opposition, this may not have happened. I think the first question that needs to be uh, taken up regarding mediation, however it is that, that, that mediates, is who is going to be at the table? Um, today, Senavet, the opposition platform I, I mentioned earlier, they, um, they put out a declaration to say that they recognise President Museveni as the mediator of these, of these talks. Um, the government, however, rejects the nature of the talks as a negotiation, but sees them purely as inter brindian dialogue. And there's been a lot of lack of coordination um, between which bodies might be doing it as an inter brindian dialogue commission set up within the country. The opposition, many of their leaders have fled, have said that it must take place outside the country, hopefully within this next week or so. We should see some talks starting to begin or take shape, probably in Kampala, um, under the, um, Museveni has, has delegated to his defence minister. What exactly is going to be on the table? It's unclear. And it seems to be the sticking point, again, comes back to the respect of the Arusha peace agreement, um, which allows the president only two terms. However, the, the, uh, the, the ruling party points to a perhaps ambiguity in the current constitution, which has allowed the current president to, to go for his, his third term. And I don't really see how the opposition and the ruling party will come to an agreement on that. Perhaps it might be a, some sort of compromise that allows the president to remain in power until 2020, but that the um, the ruling party will have to concede some kind of government of national unity and uh, involve a broader spectrum of political actors. And Patricia, so if it's the Arusha Accords that provided for uh, the mechanism for stability and peace, relatively speaking, in Burundi, and that is now being chipped away at, uh, what pressure perhaps could be brought to bear by neighbouring countries? And when I say neighbouring countries, I'm thinking of those who are one way or another they're involved in the situation in Burundi, Rwanda, the DRC, and Tanzania. I think I think they can play a major role. I mean, obviously, Tanzania and the DRC will bear the brunt of the refugee problem. Tanzania um, has over 200,000 Burundian refugees who have crossed the border over the, in the last six months or so. They, they had a it has a historical population of Burundians who they recently gave citizenship in 2007 and the assumption was that these uh you know they wanted to you know end the refugee problem in tanzania and that's not the case so i think um that you know can, tanzania has a considerable role to play in bringing about peace um they were instrumental in um ensuring that the pre president returned to burundi after the coup so um, they have a role in a sense to um promote peace and security within the region and to ensure, um, you know, the, the, the rights and stability of, the, uh, of, of Burundi. Um, obviously, you know, we, we, have, we know that President Kagame of, uh, of Rwanda has spoken out a number of times against the atrocities uh, or, you know, particularly extrajudicial killings and um, imprisonments of opposition in Burundi. And there is some tension, um, obviously, now between Burundi and Rwanda. And I think that's part of the problem why the, probably the, the, you know, the East African community negotiation has been slow, because the East African community itself is not united 
um, in terms of its mission to, to, to stop the violence in Burundi. And uh, Jonathan, in, in London, um, I suppose we could call this, for want of a better expression, third termism. Third termism seems to be sweeping across the continent, doesn't it, uh, constitutionally or otherwise. How much of a challenge then does this uh, present for the African Union? Well, it presents a very big challenge, you know, because, um, uh, but I would say that uh, this third termism, as you like to put it, you know, I, um, from my observation, is getting more prevalent in parts of Africa. It's not wholesale across the whole um, continent, okay? But the AU needs to um, be stronger, right? Just like when um, there's a coup d'etat in the African country, that country is automatically suspended, suspended from the union, okay? It should be extended and more um, stronger measures put in place to prevent African leaders trying to manipulate constitutions, you know, reinterpret them, you know, and extending their mandatory, uh, their mandatory terms. It doesn't, you know, um, uh, do anybody any credence, neither the leaders, nor the countries, nor the people, uh, the, the people over whom they rule. It doesn't do anybody any credence at all. So the AU must put in, in place measures and make sure that these measures are strictly, you know, and they're uh, uh, rigorously enforced. And Porik, is the legality of the Nkurunziza presidency actually up for discussion, or is it uh, a de facto uh, situation that now has to be put into the mix? He's here for his third term. The constitutionality of it or otherwise is, is not up for discussion. I think, unfortunately, uh, it remains very much up for discussion. Um, the Irish Agreement, as I was saying before, is very clear about only two terms. However, it was an agreement, and, and actually, um, and Kern Ziza's uh, own party, when it was still a rebel movement, was not uh, involved in those negotiations. It actually broke off from them and signed a later ceasefire agreement. So when it came into power with the 2005 constitution, that was what they were seemed to be uh, guaranteeing. And, there is certainly a loophole in the Constitution. I'm not a constitutional scholar, and there's been a lot of debate around the world from different people who can see both the loophole uh, and, and the way that actually it really shouldn't have been respected. There's also a question about whether or not Arusha is a kind of supra-constitutional uh, agreement which could be used in, in that sense. Um, I think many people, however, have shifted their argument away from the legality of the choice to go for a third term and more towards the, uh, the ethics of, of such a choice, given what's happened over the last few months. And so, Patricia, it looks as though um, Nkurunziza is here, at least for now. Um, we've already emphasised the urgency of the situation. I understand that the EU is uh, limbering up and uh, perhaps preparing to get involved. Do you see that as being a constructive way forward? I think, I think any um, pressure that is put on the Burundi government to you know, start a dialogue with the opposition, and also, I think, to immediately really um, exert some control over the security forces, if that, uh, you know, um, and as well as um, pressure on the opposition, um, to, you know, especially, you know, to, to hold back some of those paramilitary groups. If the EU can exert pressure, then I think that would be um, of enormous benefit um, to uh, a, a peace process or a sort of settlement process. I know there have been sanctions and talk about sanctions within the EU, particularly renegotiating you know, trade agreements and so on. And Burundi would be even more vulnerable economically to um, any attempts by the, you know, further attempts by EU members to reduce um, aid or to um, halt any sort of trade agreements, as the Americans have done with their, their trade agreement with Burundi. OK. Can I so uh, thank you? There. Can I thank you at that point? We've run out of time. Thank you very much, Patricia Daly, Jonathan Ofe Ansa, and Porig Makorokta in Bujumbura. Thank you all very much indeed for a really interesting conversation. Thanks a lot. And as ever, thank you for watching. You can leave your comments on the programme's page of our website, aljazeera.com. You can post your views on facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story, or you can tweet us at AJ Inside Story. But from me, Martine Dennis, and the whole team, for now, it's bye.